Welcome to God's Open. I'm your host, Christopher Fisher. On today's mini-sode, we're going to be talking about ancient Jewish conceptions of the divine body. Now, what I'm advocating here is not that you believe that God has a body or anything like that. But what I am advocating is that Jews at the time of Jesus definitely believed that God had a body. And as time progresses, you see first the Jews interacting with the Greeks on this issue and being criticized for a divine body. And then you see as the Jewish element of Christianity fades out and Christianity is replaced by people with Platonic backgrounds, you see this interplay between the Christians and the Jews. The Christians criticizing the Jews for still believing God has a body until eventually Judaism itself takes up that position. This is a good data point for understanding the Platonization, the shifting mindset, the Platonic values that infiltrate the Judeo-Christian church. What do these people care about? Platonism takes hold. We're going to start this episode by quoting Benjamin Summer, The Bodies of God. He writes this, The God of the Hebrew Bible has a body. This must be stated at the outset, because so many people, including many scholars, assume otherwise. The evidence for the simple thesis is overwhelming, so much so that asserting the carnal nature of the biblical God should not occasion surprise. We're going to supplement this with Mark Smith in his Where the Gods Are, Spatial Dimensions of Anthropomorphism in the Biblical World, which he talks about three different type of bodies that God has in the Bible. The typology proposed here suggests that the Hebrew Bible represents not one, but three types of divine bodies. The first involves a body human in scale and materiality and manifest on earth. The second entails a superhuman-sized body manifest on earth. While human in form, it is not physical like a fleshly human body. Instead, it is often luminous. The third likewise partakes of bodily form while the nature of its physicality remains unclear. This would be something about like God's energy body or God's light body that we see throughout the text of the Bible where, where his Shekinah glory descends on the mountain or fills the temple, things like that. God's a luminous, non-physical body that we do see throughout the text of the Bible. The Jews at the time of Jesus did believe that God had a body. And for evidence for this, there's an excellent paper, The Body of God in Ancient Rabbinic Judaism, Problems of Interpretation, put out by the University of Paris by Sorboni Novelle. I don't know if I said that right. It's like a French name or something like that. But it's a paper you can find on Google, which talks about the various evidences it quotes all its sources. It's it's very, very detailed. And uh, there's a lot of information to digest here about the ancient tradition. They quote the Talmud, the Mishnah, they quote the Bible, and they focus also on early Christian critics of Judaism. A common complaint in the Christian literature is that God doesn't have parts, God doesn't have a body, uh, not like those Jews believe. Those Jews believe it and uh, the Jews are wrong. It's a common Jewish conception. Origen even writes that Christians believe it. If you read Augustine, it, it seems to me to be the layman view in Christianity that God has a body. Uh, the, the sad thing is about all these situations is the layman views die out. And it's the scholarly view. It's the people who get to write the books. Those are the views that take hold and are long lasting that we have ready access to. So we have to gauge the layman view through the criticisms of the scholarly view, the, the people who are writing the books and what they criticize in common culture. You see it in Augustine, he criticizes these, these ignorant views of the masses. The masses did not hold the same theology as the preachers, as Augustine, as Ambrose. And Augustine has had some sort of riotous sermon sometimes where the layman would rebel against the things he's teaching. It was not a passive service. The layman had widespread disagreement with the, the elite class, the elite scholars, the elite theologians. So let's get straight into it. Uh, this is Justin Martyr and his dialogue with a Jew. And if the Jew would have any objections to this, you'd think that it would be laid out, the objections. This is what Justin Martyr writes. And again, when he says, I shall behold the heavens and the works of thy fingers, unless I understand his method of using words, I shall not understand intelligently. But just as your teachers suppose, fancying that the Father of all, the unbegotten God, has hands and feet and fingers and a soul like a composite being. Remember, Justin Martyr is coming out of Platonism. He talks about that in the beginning of this dialogue, his interaction with Platonism. He likes it. He loves it. 
Uh, he, he doesn't write about it in quite those words, but he does seem to have a higher regard for those ideas than others. And when he comes to Christianity, he brings a lot of those value sets. He cares about God being or not being a composite being. This is a Platonic value. It is not a Semitic value. It's not a Jewish value. The Jews literally held the belief as Justin Martyr writes, that God has a body. God is composite. Now turning to Clement of Alexandria, like Philo before him, they were appalled at any idea of God having a body. Clement writes that most men actually do hold these beliefs. Reading Clement, But the most of men, clothed with what is perishable, like cockles, and rolled around in a ball in their excesses, like hedgehogs, entertain the same idea of the blessed and incorruptible God as of themselves, but it has escaped their notice, though they be near us, that God has bestowed on us 10,000 things in which he does not share, birth, being himself unborn, food, he wanting nothing, and growth, he being always equal, and long life and immortality, he being immortal and incapable of growing old. Therefore, let no one imagine that hands and feet and mouth and eyes are going in and coming out, and resentments and threats are said by the Hebrews to be attributes of God. Right before this section, he says that, Moses gave the Greeks their ideas. This was a common claim among the early Christians that Moses was the inspiration of Plato. In this way, they tried to smuggle Plato into the Christian church, saying that Plato's just rehashing poorly Moses' super secret knowledge uh, that he gave to Plato and the others in the form of spiritual text. you got to spiritualize the text of the Bible, and then you understand that Christianity is a pure form of Platonism. This was their argument. And look at this. He says that these people who believe that God has a body, these most men, most men in this time, believe God has a body. They're like, they're bad people. They, they're they like animals and they're ignorant. Uh, so he's just insulting them. That's, that's his belief that these people are worthy of in, being insulted if they hold this belief. There's no real argument there. We'll turn now to Origen of Alexandria. Here's another Alexandria for you. This was a very Platonized city, and he talks also about God's body. We read in many passages of the divine scripture that God speaks to men. For this reason, the Jews indeed, but also some of our people, suppose that God should be understood as a man that is adorned with human members and human appearance. But the philosophers despise these stories as fabulous and formed in the likeness of poetic fictions. Because of this, it seems to me that I must first discuss a few matters and then come to those whose words which have been read. This is Origen. He's saying basically that the Jews and even some Christians believe that God has a body. This is a common thought, and it's a thought that's despised by the philosophers. As I've already said, he's taking my position. He's saying the same thing that I said before. I'm taking his position. We are going to turn next to Basil. This is Basil. He writes this, Empty from your heart all misplaced imagination. Throw away from yourself a conception which is unfitting of God's greatness. God has no form. He is simple. Do not imagine a form. For him, do not belittle him who is great in Jewish fashion. Do not enclose God in corporal concepts. Do not delimit him according to the measure of your mind. Now, I wasn't able to find the full text but this quote comes up from a paper which literally argues the, the premise of this minisode, that the ancient Jews believed that God had a body. And it's the Christians, and we understand from the Christian polemics against the Jews, that this was a common Jewish belief that the Christians criticized very heavily. The Jews during the time of Jesus believed that God had a body. This is a Jewish value, as opposed to the Platonic value of divine simplicity. As Basil argues here, he says, God has no form, he is simple. Divine simplicity is the value that he cares about. He's championing this. I don't see the Bible anywhere championing these ideas such as divine simplicity. It's not a Jewish value. I don't have the last source from this Paris University article, this Arnibus of Sikya, but he agrees with Basil. It is the Jews and the Sadducees who attribute forms to God. Forms to God. This is a Jewish value. It is very common. The Christians continually criticize the Jews for holding these beliefs, and they were eventually phased out. So real quick, what can we understand from this data? Number one, that Christianity was Platonized. Christianity gradually departed from Judaism and re placed Jewish values and Jewish concerns with Greek concerns, Greek categories such as simplicity. We could see this through the gradual phase-out 
of the idea that God has a body. This Jewish idea that God had a body was gradually phased out and replaced with Platonic values such as divine simplicity, that God can't have parts, God can't be composite, God can't have members or limbs or predicates or dependencies. This Platonic value set overrode normal Semitic thought about God. And in this way, we can see demonstrably and in real time as it's happening, the transition from Semitic concerns to Platonistic concerns, their different mindsets. Anyways, this is a lot of data in a very short period of time. Read those resources if you're interested in this topic. The Body of God in Ancient Rabbinic Judaism, Problems of Interpretation, also quoted from the Forms of God, some notes on Metatron and Christ by Gilehadu de Stromsa, which talks about the body of God in ancient Jewish beliefs using Christian opponents of the Jews as data points for understanding the traditional Jewish mindset. I also quoted from Mark Smith, Where the Gods Are, and Benjamin Summer, The Bodies of God, for understanding this topic. But what this topic does for me, what this gives me, is a very clear and undeniable data set that shift between the Jewish concept of God, Jewish concerns, Jew, what do the Jews care about? It is normal and nominative in their religion just to uh, consider God as having a body. And this becomes almost heretical. The, this idea is uh, laughed at. It's considered vulgar. And these concerns are drowned out by philosophical concerns which overtake the church in the form of Platonistic Christian values, values that weren't evident at the time of Jesus, so weren't common in the Jewish world. These are Platonists taking over the church, and we can see it. This is a real thing that happened. There is a different mindset, and we see it take over the church. <laughs>